Good evening, Deerfield. I'm Kishore Bardwaj, and I'm the last scheduled TEDx speaker for tonight. So before I get started with my talk, I'd just like to congratulate all my uh, fellow speakers on phenomenal talks, and as well, thank the TEDx team for helping put together this uh, wonderful performance and help us with preparing your talk. So could we just give them a quick hand? So with that, I'd like to get started. If you were to go to any drugstore in America, you are bound to find products that will help you get tan. There are bronzers, tanning lotions, and even melanin-boosting serums, and all sorts of crazy stuff. But instead, let's take a little bit of a trip, about halfway across the world, to a land where, over time, various races and ethnicities have ethnically bonded or amalgamated to create a naturally tan population. And with that, namaste and welcome to India. This enchanting land of over one billion people is also home to 22 major world languages, as well as many different ethnicities and cultures. And throughout history, different world powers have conquered different parts of the peninsula over time. For instance, the Mughal Empire in the north constructed world wonders that the world knows, such as the Taj Mahal and the Qutub Minar, and the Dravidians in the south who are the native people to the south, constructed beautiful Indian temples as this, hundreds of them. The one pictured here is called Mahabalipuram. It's a religious site. And the Portuguese and British conquerors also left behind their cultures and religion. And although each state has its own different cuisines, cultures, day-to-day -day customs, and languages, there are also plenty of unifying factors. Indian patriotism and national sports are two of the main glues sticking the myriads of these microcultures together. Except, it's my painful duty to inform you that there is one terrible cultural aspect tearing apart the Indian people. And that is their obsession with light skin. Remember the tanning lotion from the first slide? Imagine the opposite of that, but to an extreme extent. Imagine your mother scolding you for getting a sports tan genuinely worried that she will not be able to get you married. Imagine being rejected by a potential spouse, by the love of your life, the only reason being that you are too dark. Imagine being an overqualified candidate for a job, and your interview goes flawlessly, you nail it, but you don't get called back. Why? Because the candidate who walked in five minutes after you was just a few shades lighter. Imagine you're the darkest sibling in your family, and you grow up knowing every single day of your life that you will never be the favorite child, no matter how successful, accomplished, or philanthropic you may be. Imagine the culture around you forces you to bleach your skin and dye your hair just so you have a fair shot at success. Now, you all are imagining right now, but this nightmare, this nightmare is a reality for the beautiful but darker boys, girls, women, and men of the Indian subcontinent. If you don't believe me, and there's reason for you not to, because I've just given you hypotheticals, imagine this, imagine that, I want you to pay attention to the screen in a few minutes, a few moments, and watch a video of world-famous Bollywood actor. And for those of you who do not know what Bollywood is, it's the Indian version of Hollywood. Um, a video of Shah Rukh Khan, who's a critically acclaimed actor, endorsing a skin bleaching product. And in this advertisement, he tells a darker man in search for love, in search for a soulmate, to bleach his skin in order for him not to look like a lowly domestic to his female counterparts. And although this ad is in Hindi, which is the national language of India, the degenerate and twisted logic that it is based off of simply speaks for itself. Please. Style mara, par And That's not an anomaly. There are plenty of ads like that 
If I wanted to, I could fill up this whole TEDx talk with ads similar to that one and worse than that one, but that's for another time. Keep in mind that Shah Rukh Khan, the actor that you saw, a role model for youth and young men, my role model as a child growing up, told the man in that video to bleach his skin and endorsed this terrible practice of skin bleaching. That's pretty blunt and blatantly color discriminatory, or the shorter term, colorist. But the bluntness does not stop there. In India, where arranged marriage is still fairly common, prospective husbands and wives give resumes and a list of prerequisites for a potential spouse in the matrimonial section of a newspaper. So similar to in the States, we have the sports section, business section, etc. In India, they also have a matrimonial section just for these ads. So I've kind of pulled together a few um, newspaper clippings from different parts of India. And let's just look at a few. So this is a matrimonial section from the Sunday Times. And next to words like likes traveling and uh, you know, business major and likes kids, likes to cook, is a word that's from, I've taken newspapers from all different parts of India. And there's one word that's in common between all of them. And I'm going to ask the audience, does anybody want to guess what that word is? Fair skin? You guessed it. These newspaper clippings, as I said, are from different parts of India and give a diverse sample of how these matrimonial sections are. And this explicitly shows how apparent this fairness epidemic has become. And unfortunately, demanding fair spouses has become the norm. Now, let me show you some statistics. Uh, this graph is from BharatMatrimony.com. In addition to newspaper is in matrimonial sections. They're also dating websites. So in the US, we have eHarmony and Match.com, but in India, they have Barth Matrimony, which is a dating site for arranged marriages. So I'd like you to take a look at the South Indian graph right here. And with a little bit of addition, you can figure out that over 50% of South Indians identify as fair or very fair. When South Indians are of the Dravidian ethnicity, the same ethnicity that um, built the temples that I showed you earlier. And Dravidians are naturally dark and have curly hair. And me being a South Indian, most South Indians do not look like me. They are dark and have curly hair, resemble more African than white. So when pigs fly, that statistic is real. So why is there such a stigma? Why are these South Indians embellishing their actual skin color, acting like they're lighter and more Caucasian looking than they actually are? So I decided to research this question. Why is there such a stigma? Blame for colorism or color discrimination in India is attributed to um, different conquering powers and archaic principles throughout history, and also immigrants. In immigrants are blamed for everything these days. But uh, Indo-Aryans, who were um, immigrants from North India, who were lighter than the native indigenous Indians, there could have been a conflict there. The Mughal Empire, same people who built the Taj Mahal, hailed from the Caucasus, so there could have been some conflict and color discrimination there. The British, who are white, there could have been some discrimination there. And these, all these different powers have received their fair share, no pun intended, of blame. So I decided to research this a little bit further. So the caste system, or the Varna system in Sanskrit, has always been blamed for discrimination in India of all sorts. And what the Varna system, or caste system, basically is, it's a system that attributes different jobs to different people in a community, or originally based on merit, but now it's uh, based on hierarchy. So if I'm of a certain caste, my kids will be of a certain caste, my grandkids will be of a certain caste, etc. And this system was separating people into groups. And the first recorded incidence of this in Hindu history was in the Rig Veda, which was discovered about 3,500 years ago, written 3,500 years ago. And is a highly revered Indian text. And I looked through the Rig Veda in my free time and look, chanced upon the Purushukta, which is a verse that analogizes the caste system or Varna system to an eternal being. And I've written it here. The Brahmanas were his mouth, the Kshatriyas were his arms, the Vaishas were his thighs, the Shudras were his feet. And as you can see with uh, this pyramid here, the Brahmins refer to the members of the priest or academic caste, they were responsible for 
passing on knowledge, they held the power. The Kshatriyas were the warriors, the kings, and the legislative groups of India. The Vaishyas were the merchants or landowners, and the Shudras were the vocational caste of India and made sure that garbage wasn't rotting on the streets as the civilization progressed. And this beautiful metaphor explains that without all castes present, society would cease to function. Imagine an eternal being without a mouth or without arms. It's very hard to imagine. And many professors from universities have conjectured that the oral recitation method used to convey the Vedas and other important texts like this from mouth to mouth have maybe led to the misinterpretation of such metaphors, eventually evolving into caste and color discrimination. But I personally don't believe in this, and I'll give some more evidence. So throughout Hindu history, um, many dark and non-Brahmin, which are everyone above the priest class, um, figures have been extremely revered and are venerated on a daily basis. So two examples are Lord Krishna and Lord Rama, both incarnations of our God. And they're portrayed in blue in order to, de um, to describe detail. Otherwise, if they were portrayed in black, it would be very hard to show the intricacy of their faces. And this even goes so far to say that Krishna, which is the figure on the right, even means black in Sanskrit. And as for women, um, the maiden Draupadi from the epic Mahabharata, which is one of our um, ancient texts, was very dark and was also very beautiful. So if Hindu texts categorized people but did not discriminate by any means, then when did this deviation from mutual respect to loathing dark skin happen? Turns out that the British were notorious for imposing their archaic Victorian ideals upon the Indian people and constantly reminded their subjects of their relative significance to their European rulers. And there's one sign outside of a European club in India, and a European club is like a country club in the States in India that the only prerequisite to get in is that you have to be white. Signs like this. No dogs or Indians allowed. To make matters worse, there were black towns, there were white towns. The British segregated townships, as they did in South Africa and many other nations. Probably the worst crime that they did to Indians amongst the realm of colorism is that they gave lighter-skinned Indians more power and chances to succeed within the British government. And this led to a disparity. But I personally still don't understand. Revolutionaries like Mahatma Gandhi toiled day and night to remove caste discrimination and allowed for an equal playing field, meaning that anybody from any caste can pursue any um, profession that they like. But for some reason, India decided to do like a selective rebellion and did not rebel against all archaic and wrong principles, but for some reason decided to cling on to color discrimination and colorism. And let's see how this colorist sentiment has stayed within the Indian people years after the British left. So this um, simple random sample is of men and women who were asked if they had the choice to go on a date, would they date a lighter skinned person or not? And as you can clearly see, even taking margin of error into consideration, the numbers are both above 50%, showing how instinctively Indian, the majority of the Indian people think in that having light skin and being beautiful are synonymous. Here's another graph that shows the same random sample from before was asked to define the word beauty. And the frequency shown are the percentages of people who use the word fair or light skinned in their definition. And as you can see, both um, men and women are even taking margin of error into consideration are both above the 50% mark. And keep in mind how males are slightly more receptive to having a light skinned um, woman than females are to men. Just keep that in mind for now, I'll get to that. In this graph here, and this is a very sad and interesting graph, um, the person surveying this random sample marked each surveyee on a scale of one to five in terms of how dark or how light they were. One being very dark, five being very light. Now, they were also asked if fair is beautiful, and the percentages shown are the people who say yes. And almost disregarding your color, over 50% in each survey responded that fair is beautiful meaning that the people who were dark-skinned sadly accepted the fact that fair was beautiful, and could this insinuate that dark is not beautiful to them? Possibly. And this is 
females who know um, what were asked, were they aware of the harms of bleaching their skin? And as you can see, 84% are aware and 16% are unaware. But the majority of females did know the harmful effects of using bleach to artificially lighten their skin. And skin lightening is a very common practice in India. I showed you this ad. I carry this where, no, I don't carry this wherever I go. Um, I brought this for this, obviously. But <laughs> I got this from my local Indian grocery store in the greater Boston area, showing how it's even spread around. So if you could just pass that around, please. Showing that this epidemic is real. Now, you've seen the data. You, I've showed you some reasons behind colorism and some examples through the matrimonial ads and the color discrimination in Indian culture through that advertisement. But now comes the question, how do we fix this? If you've been zoning out my whole talk, just listen to these few words. Colorism is a prejudice, and it is deeply rooted, deeply ingrained in the Indian culture. It's like a phyllo pastry. It has multi, it's a multi-layered problem. It's a result of many other issues that I didn't even mention in this talk, such as the education disparity between the rich and the poor, the cultural competency disparity between metropolitan cities and backwards villages, and even the rigid roles men and women are supposed to play in Indian society are all to blame. And I could even give another TED talk just listing the factors that are attributed to color discrimination in India right now. Again, colorism is a prejudice. The Indian people do not need to learn cultural competency and accept that fair does not necessarily insinuate beautiful or that dark is beautiful because as you can see with this uh, statistic over here, um, a lot of people know what they're doing is wrong, that bleaching their skin is wrong, that conforming to this white ideal is wrong, but for some reason still decide to do it. It's an addiction. So instead of learning to accept, the Indian people need to unlearn the years of institutionalized colorism and the promotion of falsehood that they have been under. And as you can imagine, Unlearning something is much harder than learning something. For instance, anybody who's tried to quit a bad habit, smoking, drinking, drugs, even biting nails, it's so hard to stop this almost instinctive task. So we can solve this, but it's like a tree. It's very deeply rooted. We have to get at it obliquely. So how can we help? How can you help? There are many small solutions that need to be coupled together in order to defeat colorism and color discrimination. And I've listed a few of the problems just before. And here I present to you my small solution. And it is one small solution that needs to be kind of merged together with plenty of other solutions to um, defeat this monumental problem. So let me go back to arranged marriages for a second. So traditionally, in many other cultures as well, the woman does the domestic work, takes care of the kids, cleans the house, cooks the food, while the man makes the money. And this means that being beautiful to men has become more important and to maintain socioeconomic status because the woman is completely financially dependent on the man. And keep in mind how men were more receptive to having light-skinned brides. So this puts a burden on the woman to become as light-skinned as possible, to conform to beauty standards as much as they can. So how do I say we solve this issue? Empower women. Short answer, right? Make them financially independent. It has worked beautifully in cities. And more and more women join the Indian workforce and powers in numbers, over one billion people, the workforce is growing day by day. So how can you help sitting at Deerfield Academy? We can donate or volunteer to organizations such as CARE, Ekal Vidyala, and SIWA, which is the Self-Employment Women's Association. And these are all organizations that toil day and night to increase education in India, increase awareness in India, and also provide infrastructure for women to operate businesses in India. And what this will do, especially in the rural parts, is help women become financially independent. And by you know, donating, volunteering, and even perhaps even working at organizations like these, we can hopefully one day make it such that an Indian woman's socioeconomic status has no correlation at all to the color of her skin. And literally, Ekal Vidyala can support what one Indian child's education for literally a dollar a day. So, Next time you want to buy a coffee at Cumberland Farms, redirect that dollar to Ekal Vidyala. One more day of education for a child, one step closer to defeating colorism. Such a deeply rooted issue. We should get started on now before it gets worse. So now that you know how 
to solve it slightly. I'm gonna end this on a personal note. So I have a big family, and with big families comes a lot of birds. And about two years ago, my, uh, I guess she's a toddler now, cousin Lila was born. About six months ago, my baby cousin Annika was born. And uh, look, they're so cute. Annika's on, their, uh, on your left and Lila's on the right. And uh, about two weeks ago, my baby cousin Amara was born. So, you know, I have so many new cousins now. And Amara was named after my great-grandmother, who's unfortunately no longer with us today. But she was loving, independent, driven, feisty, and she was also very dark. And regardless of how dark these um, babies, these, my beautiful baby cousins, turn out to be, I want to guarantee their fair shot at success and, to a certain extent, make the color of their skin irrelevant relative to their siblings, relative to the rest of the people. And hopefully one day, my cousins will not only be able to appreciate their true skin color, but the greater Indian population will be able to realize that the in, the, uh, will be able to realize that they should be able to see through the insignificant pigment of the membrane covering our bodies and instead appreciate what truly is on the inside. And with that, thank you for your time.